Marley was dead to begin with. There's no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. And Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. Scrooge and Marley were partners for I don't know how many years. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone with Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. And once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house, a grim, cheerless place if ever there was one. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, Bob Cratchit, who in a cold and dismal little cell beyond... Worked at his ledgers. From the historic haunted heartland of Omaha, Nebraska, my name is Brian Corey, and I welcome you all to this episode of the world famous Necronomicast. My guest tonight for a late night conversation is author, podcast host, storyteller, adventurer, and explorer of the unexplained Jeff Belanger. He's written more than a dozen books that have been published in six languages, and he is the Emmy-nominated host, writer, and producer of the New England Legends series on PBS and Amazon Prime. Now, the focus of our talk tonight is about his fantastic new book, Just in Time for the Holidays, The Fright Before Christmas. So cozy up for a conversation about this wonderful, dark, cold, dangerous, and frightening time of the year. And now calling in on the Necronomicast hotline from the Boston area. Please welcome back to the show, Mr. Jeff Belanger. Jeff, how you doing, man? Hey, Brian. Good to be back with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I was just thinking the last time I had you on the show, we were talking about your great book about climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. And I was just thinking about the Boston area. And you were trying to convince me, uh, listeners probably remember, you're trying to convince me to come out there and go sharken or, or go jump in a cage oh. and face my fears you know, challenge myself like you did in Kilimanjaro by by uh, experiencing great white sharks out there. Right. Yeah, we had a, a, a few summers ago, there was a bunch of them and they were closing beaches. And I was like, Oof, we've all seen this movie. We know how it ends. <laughs> That's right. I still <laughs> I still haven't done it. I've been to our Omaha Zoo that has plenty of sharks, but not the great white that you have. Got it. Yeah. Well, I'm so excited to have you on the show, man. I Over the summer, you announced that you were coming out with this new book, The Fright Before Christmas. And I was like, what a perfect, what a perfect holiday theme show to gather the kids around and listen to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And last year I had uh, the great Troy Taylor on about his book, One Bleak Midwinter Night, uh, talking about all the tragic things that have happened around the holidays. And so this one, like this one's a little bit more festive, but it still revolves around punishment of children a lot. Yeah. And death, plenty of death, a lot of drinking, a um, lot of drinking too, a lo- lot of drinking, a lot of death, a lot of celebrating. And I, I think, um, you know, has times changed really that much? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, there's still a lot of drinking around the holidays. We get through it. However we have to, you know, whether it's self-medicating or whatever, but, um, yeah, no, I, I, I love this holiday more than I ever did before because I kind of went down the rabbit hole discovering its roots and its roots are dark. I always thought I was a Halloween person. I mean, that's how most people know me was for Halloween and ghosts and hauntings. But wow, when you go down and learn the history of, of the Christmas holiday, it is literally the darkest of all the holidays, literally meaning that it's, it's midwinter, it's the winter solstice, it's the shortest day, it's the longest night. Um, but also it's, it's a time to be afraid. It's a time to be the most afraid that we are all year because this season could kill you. Yeah. I love this. Uh, when you mentioned Halloween a second ago, you had a great line in the introduction to your book that Halloween is just the warm up act for the most mm. frightening holiday of the year. And I too, and I think I've said this on the show in years past, I too have always wondered and kind of, you know, thought out loud about Andy Williams. And uh, the most wonderful time of the year when he's talking about the scary ghost stories, uh, sharing those. And I'm like, I didn't have a tradition of that growing up. It was always, you know, Nat King Cole or uh, Bing Crosby and lots of um, lots of food. And, you know, Charles Dickens was thrown in there, you know, for good measure. Yeah. But but not this uh, this uh, tradition of scary ghost stories 
and really everything that's frightful about about the Christmas season. It, and like you said, it all goes back to winter solstice and and our agricultural roots uh, of being hunkered down for the entire winter with no electricity and trying to survive the winter. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's really what this is about. It started with Saturnalia, a Roman festival where you uh, celebrate the harvest. Satis means to sow. The god Saturn is worshipped. And if harvest is good, you know, it's, you, you should be okay for the winter. You've got food. And they would celebrate. It was a, a two-day party turned into a three-day party, turned into a, a week-long festival, uh, December 17th to the 23rd. And it was it was a it was a huge time. You give gifts, you dress in festive clothes, you society gets turned upside down. You've got merrymakers and so on. Uh, and the whole tradition was about like celebrating what we have. the The meat is fresh, the wine and the beer have been made, and that's fresh. And so this is a, a time to feast and celebrate the harvest, but also to look out for each other because we know we got to hunker down for the winter. And then further north, it was called Yule, um, which is the winter solstice, and then. Same thing, though, uh, even more dangerous, you know, at least in the Roman era area, it's a little more temperate. But if you go further north, it's not. You're looking at some tough winters where you don't have any farm work to do. You got to keep your idle hands busy. You hope your roof will hold up the, to the snow. Winter kills everything around you. The whole landscape is dead. You know, flowers and leaves and trees and grass and even the ponds and the and the lakes freeze. They, they freeze solid. It's a really frightening time. And so when facing down the, the barrel of that gun, we party, we party and we celebrate <laughs> and we, we try to, you know, make, make good times with each other. Right. And plus everybody was just busting their rear ends, uh, like you said, with the end of the harvest and getting everything stockpiled and ready and for, for this long winter ahead. And one thing that's, uh, that's a reoccurring theme, like in all these, in a lot of this folklore and a lot of these traditions is keeping kids in line. So I can just imagine like you have kids, I have kids. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking about you know, like, uh, as, as it's colder outside, they're inside more. And of course, then, uh, kids being inside, you know, they're so rambunctious and everything. So there's a lot of legends, a lot of lore about staying in line or else you'll get something from Krampus. You'll get something from, from all these different, uh, entities and all this different great mythology of a, of a switch of hickory across your backside at the, <laughs> or being devoured too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, that's, and, and part of that, by the way, so one of the things we forget, we think these monsters are here to scare us and hunt us, and they are, there's no question. Mm -hmm. But ultimately they serve us, they keep us safe. Uh, uh, we, we tell our children, don't go outside. In, if you're in Iceland, don't go outside in, at midwinter. The gorilla will get you. She's an ogress. She comes down from the mountain. She's got 13 tails. She's got the Yule lads with her, the Yule cat. And she will hunt you down and she will kill you. The, the gorilla, unlike some of the other monsters, doesn't discriminate. You could be good or bad. Imagine that. <laughs> it, it, but here's the thing. If you're a parent and you, you know this in Reykjavik, right? You get about four hours of daylight around the solstice. That's it. If you go further north, it gets less. And if you go all the way to the very tip of, of Iceland, you might get, you're just about at the uh, Arctic Circle. So no sunshine. If you're caught outside in the woods at night, uh, in the darkness, when it's cold and snowy, whether it's the grilla that kills you or the elements, does it matter? Right? I mean, <laughs> right. You're, the, the end result is you're dead. Right. And so if, if these monsters can keep us safe at a time when we really should be inside, hunkered down safe, making offerings to our ancestors, praying, you know, looking out for each other. Um, you know, they, they ultimately serve us if you think about it. And they've been around a long time and have had many different names and appear in many different cultures. Yeah, one of my favorite like memories from elementary school, we had a French teacher, Mrs. Rhoda. Mrs. Rhoda would come in at Christmas time and she would tell us some stories. I can't, you know, remember everything and and all the mythology or folklore that she was telling us in the customs. But in French class, I remember she had us take off our shoes and put them down. And then we pretended like to take a nap on the floor while she put either a stick in our shoe or she put a candy cane in our shoe. And man, one year I got a stick. Now later she, oh. she exchanged it for a candy cane, but I remember getting the stick and cause she told us a story, you know, this is like early eighties that, you know, you would get a stick and then you would get beat with it. <laughs> I, was worried, I was worried about Mrs. Rhoda, you know, taking a crack at me with one. So was she teaching you about Père Futar? She might've been, like I said, I was just a kid and I just remember like yeah. uh, 
you know, like, oh, this is fun. We're going to take off our shoe and put it in. And then she put a, you know, a stick in there. Uh, I got a stick one year for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I love it. And so when I was a kid growing up, the consequence for bad behavior was coal in the stockings or sticks or yeah. less presents or no presents, right? Those were the only things that I had to worry about. But imagine if my parents had told me, if you're naughty, there is a monster that will come and sneak into your room, snatch you from your bed, put you into a sack with other naughty kids and drag you off to a mountain lair. Or uh, if that's too much for you, there's there's a, a, a man covered in furs with a switch of sticks that'll just beat you mercilessly um, until you behave in time for Christmas. I didn't grow up with that. And <laughs> I, I, and I'm not saying I, I was uh, I was robbed of something, but I do feel like these these creatures and these ideas have always been there, um, but they really got pushed into the dark corners really around the 1920s and 30s um, when when Santa rose to superstar and prominence, and a lot of people felt that there was no room for these monsters anymore. Mm -hmm. But I think they've just been biding their time. I think they're coming back. And and my my evidence of that isn't just my book. I mean, the, the Krampus movie that came out in 2015 and Krampus festivals, Krampus walks, Krampus runs that are all over the world now, not just Austria and Germany. Like these ideas are catching on and coming back um, because I think they're in our DNA. They're they're in the, the deep parts of ourselves and we're celebrating all the dark stuff that that makes up this holiday and always has. What's cool about your book is like you just say like Krampus is kind of making a comeback. I, you know, I'm 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 in my mid to late forties, right? And so I didn't mm -hmm. hear about Krampus until mm, twenty years ago, really. And you know, I kind of keep my finger on the pulse of these things, you know, sure. things that are spooky, things that are kind of ghostly or or monstrous. And I didn't really hear, know much about Krampus until it started kind of in, invading pop culture a little bit here. And then and then of course the movie. But now there, there was a restaurant here in Omaha that had a um, a big life-size Krampus uh, statue in the entrance of the restaurant called the Monster Club, and and it had complete with a backpack with a kid kind of hanging out of it. And this I is, love it. I know me too. It was like how it greeted you. So like for sure, it's becoming way more mainstream. Uh, these kind of uh, uh, alternative celebrations of the of the era or the the season. I, I'm actually I. I Believe you're wrong. You did have Krampus in your childhood. You just don't remember him. He went by a different name. Help me out. Yeah. He, he out. was green, uh, oh. <laughs> furry, and he lived in a mountain over Whoville. Right. And that was absolutely, I mean, if that's not Krampus, do tell, right? I mean, the Grinch, the Grinch is Krampus. Like that is lifted, plagiarized, whatever <laughs> word you want to use, right out of German folklore by Dr. Seuss, right? That's, that's the Grinch. I'm so glad you brought that up because uh, when you were writing about that in the book, uh, I don't want to give away like so much about your book. I mean, we're having a discussion <laughs> here, but, but yeah, you make a point of saying like we had Krampus growing up, but it was like you said, this green monster that lived with the dog Max up in the hill and terrorized the citizens and performed breaking and enterings uh, in the community <laughs> of Whoville. Right. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And so, so I feel like the reason the reasons that something gets popular. I once heard a, a quote that talked about um, songwriting and, and he said, um, the thing about a great song is it sounds familiar the first time you heard it, mm. which is impossible, right? It's, that's literally impossible. Um, but it does because there's something in there, some, some like truth bell that, that gets rung inside of us. And I think these stories are coming back because they never totally went away. They're in our DNA. They're in our, our fiber. They're in our, our communities. And of course, especially in America, we're such a melting pot of different cultures. Germans brought over Belschnickel and Krampus when they came and French brought over Père Futar and, and Dutch brought over Sinterklaas. And so we, we have all these various influences that come and go as they're needed. And I think maybe now is a time when we, we need that again, right? When we, we need the consequence of the holiday, we need the, the warning because we, we, we're getting a little soft, Brian, you know what I mean? Like we, we, we got year round heat, you know, we can get, we can get DoorDash, you know, like for sure. we can, you know, uh, yeah. DoorDash, you know, we work from home, of course. Sure. Yeah. So things have gotten a little bit easier than they were for our ancestors. And so maybe these monsters have to come back and remind us that it is still dangerous out there and that, um, and that we do need them and that, um, but, but more than anything, I think what they're here to deliver is, is, is really what, what Scrooge experienced, right? The, the redemption, 
Like you, you can't, I don't, maybe there's a way that somebody out there could wake up tomorrow and say, I just want to change my life for the better because that's the right thing to do. Maybe that person exists. I've never met such a human being, but most of us have to go through some trials and tribulations before we, we make these life altering decisions. And the only way to do that is to face your ghosts and face your demons. And when you, when you are in a dark place, only then can you see the light, right? I mean, there's otherwise it's, it's all relative. So I love the idea that we can go through this, this time of year, that we can embrace these dark things because only through a little bit of fear, can we make those ever important changes? Whether that means like quitting smoking or eating better or exercising again, or, you know, calling mom a little more often or what, whatever it is that, that makes you feel like you're living a better life. Um, you know, those, those things are available to us, but only if we're afraid. So with this book, like you even have it split into three acts, like, uh, or three parts, hope and then fear, like we were just talking about, and then also redemption. So like at the end of this long, long winter time at the, at the end of this solstice of being hunkered down, you know, we can emerge, hopefully a little changed, uh, very thankful that we survived the winter and, uh, get ready to, you know, go through all these traditions again. Um, the book is great. Like, you, you know, when you, when you order something, you don't know what it's going to look like, you know, when you get it in your hands, when you open it up, but I got to compliment you, man. The, the, it's, you know, it's hardcover. It's got a wonderful stitched in bookmark and the art is, is fantastic. Like how long did it take for you to put this book together? Cause it's, it's, it's more than just like you just writing. It's just a, a really nice package. Well, so thank you. And, and, uh, this was, a, this was a team effort. That was the publisher that did all the packaging. Right. But mm -hmm. I, we knew from the beginning from, so I, this, this whole thing started about 10 years ago for me. Wow. Um, someone asked me to give a, a talk, uh, I'd been doing Halloween talks and monsters and ghosts and all kinds of weird things, uh, for, for many years. And someone said, Hey, would you give a talk on Krampus to our, our little organization here? And I was like, oh, that's cool. Like I, I, you know, I mean, I knew a little bit about it and it was an excuse to sort of look into them a little bit more, which was great. And then as I started doing those talks, people would say, hey, have you heard about this monster from this country or the Thompson from this country? And, and so every time I gave it, I would just write things down and go back and I kept adding to it. And so this became a really popular Christmas show for me over the years. And then a publisher I've been working with for, for years called and said, this is, this should be a book. And I said, you're right. And it's, I've been meaning to get to it. I said, but I, I don't want it to just be like another book. They're like, no, no, no. We want full color, hardcover. Um, you know, they, 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 they he even said like, you, you might notice there's a built-in bookmark. It's red mm -hmm. and it's, it's meant to be forked like Krampus's forked tongue. I yeah. noticed that it's beautiful. Isn't that cool? So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so once we started doing that and then started working on it and that we really wanted it to look like a book you would gift that she would leave out for the holidays. And, uh, and true, my, you know, my thought is, uh, one of my favorite all time movies is of course, nightmare before Christmas. Mm -hmm. And there's a long debate. Is that a Halloween movie or a Christmas movie? And if you love it, you don't care, right? I'll watch it from October through January, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it works any one of those days. And I, I definitely want to be in that vein where like, you know, it, it, the, the thing about the, um, the holidays uh, I know this is audio only, but I'm going to show you anyway. But yeah. I, I bought this wheel recently and, and all over the world, there are uh, four major holidays, right? And that is winter, spring, summer, fall. And then halfway between each of those major holidays are the half holidays. So for example, halfway between the fall equinox and the winter solstice is Samhain, the Celtic New Year, New Year which is Halloween, right? So like halfway in between, Halloween is the sun setting literally on the year until it gets to be midnight, Yule, until the, the sun finally sets on midwinter. And that is when it is dark and cold and scary and frightening and dangerous. And when we when we sort of think of our, our lives in these cyclical terms, I mean, I live in, in New England, so we've got the four seasons. Sometimes we have the four seasons in a single day. I mean, you know, it can get crazy with weather. However, um, you know, when you sort of think of it that way, then there's a seasonality to everything that we do. And there's a time to, to sow, a time to reap, uh, a time to harvest, and a time to hunker down and pray that you survive. <laughs> and so I feel like that redemption used to be built in even, even like just a century ago, right? Um, just 100 years ago, it was a totally different picture. You know, you could get snowed in for days. Um, you know, it, it, now we take it for granted with modern snow plowing and everything else. Like you have a big storm, maybe maybe 24 hours you're you're stuck inside, you know, and then... And then we're out, which is amazing and wonderful and great because people are safe. But 
Um, but there was a time not that long ago when it really was that dangerous. And so if, if we can sort of like celebrate all that, um, that was the idea that this book would be a, a time to, um, you know, to celebrate the dark parts and also, um, you know, look inside and see what changes we can make if we get scared enough. Sure. No, I did a lot of introspection when I was reading through the book, like in 97, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1997, uh, Omaha, where I live, where the show comes from, we had a huge like ice storm in October and the ice storm like snapped a bunch of uh, like citywide, region wide, snapped a bunch of tr old trees. So they destroyed a lot of the power lines. So lots different places in Omaha, like in my mom's neighborhood, she was out of power for like seven days and she had to stay with friends and everything. So we didn't have like the terrible bone chilling cold, you know, for a long time. Cause it warmed up, you know, like in November. Right. However, but like six, seven, eight days of no power, no refrigeration, no heat, no air, no, no nut, no electricity, no, no nothing. So I remember all that time and just thinking like, we had just like this little teeny taste uh, of like this bleakness of winter. Your writing really just kind of like brought that to the fore in my brain uh, and trying to help me picture like what it was like when all these traditions started. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a different time. And and the, the amazing thing about Christmas is that, I mean, I grew up with, with Christmas. I was raised Roman Catholic and I, I was, we have our own family traditions and you realize that Christmas has always sort of been packaged nostalgia. You know, like it is, it is a packaged event where, um, you know, like whatever your tradition is, oh, we watch this movie every year, a wonderful life, whatever, right? Like whatever your family does is cool. And the amazing thing is that you can change it on any given year. Right. You don't you can let go of stuff that doesn't work anymore. You can adopt new ideas, whether it's foods that you like to make for your family or, uh, you know, charities you give to whatever it is. What, it doesn't matter. And so the, this holiday is so malleable. Now, when I was a kid, I remember thinking, man, oh, man, like I had Jewish friends. And is Santa Claus an anti-Semite? He doesn't visit them. Right. Like, that's not cool. Santa is this amazing guy. And how could he like not visit my Jewish friends? Right. And and I you realize. Once and and I've always struggled with that always because I'm like that's not the spirit of what this holiday is supposed to mean the way I was taught it anyway, like everyone was supposed to be included and back then centuries ago everyone was included it was about the winter solstice mm -hmm. the winter solstice affects every human being that lives there it doesn't matter what you believe or don't believe who you pray to or don't pray to you got to face down the winter just like everybody else so you throw these parties. Uh, and you you commune about it. And, and the irony is that, you know, Christianity has been at war with Christmas from about the year 336 AD until roughly 1980, as in like just a few decades ago. Like, I remember my priest, Father Lawler, this guy was a tough man, right? Mm. Uh, we, it was, it was uh, uh, Saturday in the church hall. I was a kid and it was Christmas time and Santa was coming to give us candy canes and a little wrapped Christmas gift, which was a, a plastic rosary, right? That was wrapped in the box. Sure. And Santa walked in and I remember looking at Father Lawler, looking at Santa with like death eyes, like trying to make <laughs> Santa's head explode with lasers. And I'm like, dude, that's Santa freaking Claus. Are you kidding me? Like, what's wrong with you? You know, and 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 it, it infuriated him because he knew he knew that that this was a representation of all things pagan, mm. of all things that had nothing in the world to do with Christianity or whatever. And the the funny thing is that Christianity does not hinge whatsoever on the birth of Jesus. I mean, yes, Jesus had to be born, but it's not an important part of the story in, in Christianity and, and in the religion. Right. The, the death and resurrection, it all hinges on Easter. Easter is what defines a Christian, period, right? Jesus had to die and get resurrected. Yeah. That defines Christianity. Being born, we've all been born, right? Like that's that's the thing. And so um, so it's not a big holiday uh, from a theological perspective, but boy, you would think so now, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's the one day some people go to church <laughs> and no other. Yeah, they, so, yeah, they, yeah. And here, no other referred to uh, as C and E's, like Chris, or Christmas and Easter uh, only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the most important uh, part of the Christian or the Catholic um, calendar is is the night before Easter, the Holy Vigil. Right. You know. Right. That's right. No, nah, not not Christmas Eve. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. And yet, that's the one. That's the one that's packed, right? The the, sure. the that's bursting at the seams, and 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 I've I've seen priests that are just like, well, this is an opportunity to try to bring people back into the fold. Let's make this a wonderful place. I've seen others that just chose to read the book about who beget who beget who beget who beget who, and I'm like, oh my goodness, saying like I'm going to punish you for only coming once a year. <laughs> 
which was, I've seen that happen. And I'm like, I think this is punishment. I think he's literally mad at us because he knows we're not here the rest of the year now. Yeah, it could be. I had an old Irish friend, an old Irish priest friend who used to talk about that too. And he's like, the one time a year people come back, you know, you should be as as gracious and inviting and, and be as welcoming as possible. And that's what he tried to do. But so many other places were just, you know, like, oh, you're only here on Christmas and Easter, huh? Well, well, Easter, you could you could make a stronger argument that like, well, that's the one that counts more. Right. But uh, for, <laughs> for, for Christians. But but the one I mean, whatever puts butts in seats, sure. I say, you sure. know, sure. Um, and not only that, were you raised Catholic too, Brian? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like, remember the stations of the cross yeah. on the side of the, the church? Oh, yeah. Dude, this is a horror show. Oh, yeah. Right. It's literally a man being tortured like for real embossed on, on the stations of the cross around the church. And you would sit there and go, Oh my gosh, this is really, I mean, a, the man is being tortured. He's being crucified. Sure. And, and, and you, you see all that. And then the, the, the Catholic cross is not just the cross. It's, you got to see a man nailed to it. Right. And, and with a crown of thorns and everything. So we were exposed to some pretty rough stuff uh, as far as imagery goes. And that was in every church that was in my church, your church, like all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we we're sort of used to handling the macabre when it comes to spiritual things, um, which is why I was I'm sort of surprised in hindsight why these monsters kind of went away. But I'm glad they're coming back. I welcome them. I think they they have things that uh, to teach us. I think they have uh, stuff for us to learn. Um, and and uh, I, I attended it was a couple of years ago. I attended the uh, Krampus Ball, the New England uh, Krampus Society's Krampus Ball. And oh my gosh, it was amazing. This was before COVID. And it was, uh, it was, there was probably about 30 to 40. Yeah. Well, that's, that was the most recent one. So 30 to 40, uh, Krampuses all dressed up. They looked incredible. I mean, these, this was, they took time and money on these, these costumes. Right. And it was an incredible event, uh, of, of, and they, they went for a walk down the street and all this other stuff. It was just so cool to see it and embracing this, this part of the holiday. And, uh, I don't know. I, I, it's coming back. But where my parents live in Connecticut, they live in this little small town in Connecticut. And I was able to give this this talk uh, a couple of years ago at their library. And there was a few little old ladies who saw Krampus on my my shirt. And she said, well, who, who is that? And I said, well, I'll tell you actually very soon. So just stay <laughs> seated. But uh, But anyway, she said, so we had our Christmas parade today in town. And it was full of everything you would ever expect in a Christmas parade, the high school band, Santa on a sleigh, the fire trucks, the police cars, and so on. She's like, but there was a hairy monster with horns walking in there. And I was like, oh, if Krampus made it to this little town, he could be anywhere. I like, and and next year, maybe maybe this year, there'll be two Krampuses, you know, in the, in the parade and so on. And that's just this little town and this little conservative area of Connecticut, which uh, I thought was great. So I, 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 like I said, they're coming back because we are collectively bringing them back. Well, I love uh, these stories because it connects us to our ancestors. And I love learning about different traditions and everything. You, you don't have to embrace every single thing that you read about. or But I just love and appreciate the history and just how rich culturally all these things kind of meld together over time. And as families marry into each other and as cultures collide. And, you know, it's just neat to see like how things kind of present themselves now. And you do a, a, a really good job at the end of the book talking about everybody's favorite Christmas ghost story, uh, A Christmas Carol, and and like the evolution of that and how it's so popular nowadays. And you're talking about, you're writing about Alistair Sims' version from 1951. And that's a that's a fantastic one. I, I, I sometimes overlook that one because uh, there's so many uh, versions of it but yeah a, of course a, a christmas Muppets. carol <laughs> right yeah. but a christmas yeah. carol what a what a what a great tradition that we have too with that it's it's a story that works and so uh this what andy williams said there'll be scary ghost stories that used to be a, a popular tradition around england and europe right you would write ghost stories charles dickens was not the first nor the last however uh i think it's fair to say he was the best hmm. because his still holds up um, I, I know I have friends that work in theaters around here and they'll tell you how all of them do a Christmas carol every December. And he said that he's like, we charge more for that ticket than any other. And the profits from that one performance will will fund like six different minor plays that hardly anyone goes to the rest of the year. 
He's like, so that's our moneymaker because people want to consume that story. The Alistair Sim version, you know, when I was growing up, I, I feel like the Christmas spirit was this sort of inherent thing. Like you just caught it, right? You, you, Christmas is coming, Santa's coming, you're excited for toys and all this other stuff. Um, and then as, as I got older, I started to notice like the Christmas spirit used to last the whole month. It used to be all of December, at least, maybe actually probably arguably from the time the, the dessert fork hit the plate on Thanksgiving <laughs> until until New Year's, right? Like you would just be floating. I was anyway. But that that time got, that window got shorter and shorter and shorter. And then once my daughter was born, okay, it was really fun again. Like that that really renewed my my spirit of the holiday. But, you know, she's a teenager now. And I, I, I have found in recent years that like, I, I, I want that. It's a drug, right? I'm, tra- I'm chasing that high oh, yeah. uh, and looking for it. And so, um, you know, it, whether it's decorating or whatever, if I can't find it there, Alistair Sims version of A Christmas Carol, and I, I own it on DVD and I still have a DVD player, <laughs> you know, <laughs> guilty. Uh, th- that's, that's, the, that's, the, I'm going to go get my fix. You know what I mean? And I find if I just watch that, I just, I, I remember what the holiday was supposed to be about. There's, they, there's a whole movie that says the man who invented Christmas is Charles Dickens, right? I mean, that was a, a movie a couple of years ago and it's not untrue at all. Like what you're supposed to feel uh, about this holiday, how you're supposed to think of it was defined by a, a ghost story. One of the greatest ever told by a master. And I, I, I'm sort of joking, you know, like with, with my humble little book, Charles Dickens invented Christmas. I'm just trying to save it. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you said, like so many things when you were just talking, like uh, here in Omaha, one of the great traditions in Omaha is the longstanding run of a Christmas Carol at the Omaha community playhouse. And I, for 25 years, uh, played trumpet in the pit, not for that show. Cause there's no brass and that's all woodwinds and strings, but, but that production running from November through December 23rd, every year would put the theater into the black and would fund all these experimental and all, all these other kind of plays that not near as many people would go to. And like, you know, I mean, like I said, I'm in my forties, this tradition started a long time ago in Omaha and it's still rolling. They're going to be sold out pretty soon when tickets go on sale. Um, yep. And then, like, what I love about it, too, is, like, the redemption of Scrooge at the end. But it's also scary as hell. There was a f- filmation or some kind of cartoon version that was made, like, in the late 60s that I caught uh, in the 70s and 80s when I was a kid. And the the ghost of Marley scared the hell out of me when I was a little kid. And I saw a screenshot of it the other day. And I'm like, whew, boy, yeah, that Marley. <laughs> and another hey. another Christmas tradition where you're... You know, you're pretty much uh, threatened if you don't change your ways you're, uh, to a life of wandering the earth in torment and despair. Uh, so you better catch the spirit of the holidays now while you can. I, I think Marley is, um, he's my favorite character. Well, second favorite. Uh, Scrooge, of course, is my favorite. But I, I think Marley is the ghost that's overlooked. If you ask people like, hey, real quick, how many ghosts are there in A Christmas Carol? A lot of people say three, right? Ghosts of Christmas, past, present, future. Right, right. But everyone forgets that Jacob Marley was the, the ghost that made it all happen, was the one that came and said, Scrooge, this is what's waiting for you, the way you're living your life, right? You you, you and I were equals seven years ago. All these chains, I forged it link by link, and you've been working on yours ever since. It's a ponderous chain. And, and it's only near the very end of A Christmas Carol that it dawns on us who Scrooge is, right? It, it hits us. We're like, oh, no, I just realized who Scrooge is. He's me. I'm Scrooge. The book's about me. The story's about me. It was about me the whole time. I'm getting miserly and older and crankier and rah, humbuggy and, you know, and all this <laughs> other stuff. And I don't want to do this or that. I just work and rah, you're in my way. And, you know, uh, that's me. And if we get haunted by our past, by our ghosts, we have a chance to change just like Scrooge did. Because if a guy that hardened and cold can change, then, of course, we can, too, because we're not that bad. I mean, I'm bad. I'm not that bad. Right. And so that that's the hope. That's the hope of redemption in this single night, that we can still be redeemed. And we might lose it somewhere along the way in the coming months, of course. But next year, we have another shot at, at bringing it around again and, and at least resetting the clock. And that's what I love about that story. It is so powerful. It's so important. And teaches us that, like, you know, family, giving your workers a day off, giving them, showing them appreciation giving to charity, uh, the service of others is, is what it ultimately is about looking out for people that, that need a little bit of help. That's the feeling of, of what this is supposed to mean and being, you know, grateful for what you do have. 
um, that's the lesson. And I, I, as sappy as it sounds and as tried and true, maybe as it sounds, I don't, I don't care. Like I, we need that reminder. And so if your theater company performing it, you know, to fund all that, those other shows and all that other art throughout the year. If, um, if that's what it's, if Muppets have to tell us the story, right. (laughs) Right. Or, or cartoons, whatever it is, uh, bring it. I welcome it. I welcome those ghosts every single December for sure. Yeah. And and great job with the historical context too. I enjoyed reading about how when there was past productions or it was just even just Charles Dickens or somebody reading it from the stage and the audience would sit there and listen to it, the whole book as it's being read to them. Uh, yeah. yeah, just it's just how powerful and how how that story endures. I always wish that there was like a, and this is probably sound weird, but like a a post credit scene to a Christmas Carol, kind of like at the end of uh, Return of the Jedi. You know, when when uh, Darth Vader's kind of redeemed at the end and he's kind of waving at the, <laughs> with Yoda at the end. Like it would be nice if like Marley was like, "Hey, yeah. because I helped redeem Scrooge," you know, they cut you know. 30, uh, 50% of the chains off, you know, like, you know, like maybe there's a, a, like a, like take Marley's story and have him like, you know, work off this, uh, this purgatory that he's in. I always feel bad Think about for him, it, you know, like Scrooge is like, Brian, Hey dude, I'm fine. <laughs> it, it, yeah. You say that, but then it doesn't work. It all falls apart. It's too late. He had to do it in life, yeah. right? You have to make these changes while you're alive. You don't get a second shot at this, right? That was and other, if, uh, Darth Vader. Th- that's I, 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 I'm sorry to, to question the, the, the great George Lucas, but right. <laughs> yeah. But I guess Vader was redeemed right before death. Right. So he was okay. Right. If, if we're looking at like a the, from a theological perspective, he, sure. he, he killed the spoilers. He killed the emperor. <laughs> right? He said, son, I love you, <laughs> you know, and then died. And it was all was forgiven. Deathbed confession, deathbed conversion. Okay. We're all right. Um, but Marley died too late. Too late. The die has been cast. But I get it. I get it. Our, our, our modern hearts are like, I want to see everybody win. But you know what you got, Brian? You didn't get Marley, but you did get Tiny Tim doing okay at the very end. So Yeah. Uh, well, and I know like it's sequel itis. I always wonder too, like, what would have happened to Tiny Tim? Did he flourish? Did he become, you know, I mean, because of this generous act by Scrooge and he saved Tiny Tim, maybe Tiny Tim became this great down the line. You never know. I just always like yeah. to think about these things and, and how the redemption kind of keeps, you know, it's just not one singular act. You know, it, it has a, a shockwave, a ripple effect of one man, Scrooge, changing his life, how that changed an entire community. Hopefully, maybe I'm just kind of, <laughs> I don't know, active imagination. Yeah. No, I, I I get it. I totally get it. And th- and that's you know, but and that's also goes to like just how important these stories are, you know. And and there's a seasonality to them. We don't think about old Scrooge when it's July, um, you know. We we think about uh, we think about him when when it's getting cold and when, you know, when when we're we're facing down that that long bleak winter. And so, um, it, you know, I love that that restaurant has a Krampus there. Like it's it's a little subtle reminder. Like instead of just all happy lights and consumerism. It's, oh, don't forget about the dark stuff that's hunting us. And and the reason you want to be good, the reason you want to give gifts and show appreciation is because, right, that this stuff is out there too. Um, maybe we need, I, I think we need these reminders and that's why they're coming back. Now, I know you do these uh, lectures and speaking engagements at libraries and other places, theaters. Uh, are, are you thinking about any time doing something? Because I think like a Christmas show, like I think you'd be fantastic. I watched your... Um, you had a PBS thing uh, where you had ghost stories uh, at a beautiful theater and you rehearsed it and like you had these great, these great uh, speakers and presenters. I think this kind of lends itself to some kind of like live stage production. Have you ever thought about anything like that? Oh, I have. Yeah. I'm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm in talks with a, a couple different people about seeing how we can literally make that happen. Cause it, it, you know, you call it a lecture. I, I actually st- It's a show. Like yeah. I want it to be a show, not without apology. This is a performance. Um, I'm doing about a dozen of them, but they're all here in New England. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's there's smaller venues, but I've watched audiences sort of transform from this story, and it's incredible because it, and it's just it's the same way I transformed, and I'm just laying it out there exactly how it happened for me from 
you know, humbugging the whole thing going, why am I even doing this? And th- this, this whole book was my effort to answer questions because it was cold outside. I was hanging the wreath on my front door with like, the fake wreath. It's all plastic. It's completely fake. And the crafting wire from the year before broke and uh, my fingers were numb because it was so cold. They were hardly working. It hit the ground. And I was like, you know, I swore all kinds of swears. And I said, why do I do this? Why am I going through the stupid Christmas lights? Half of them are out from last year. You know, it's so cold outside. All the money we're going to spend, we're going to go on a hawk for months. You know, why the Christmas tree? Why the evergreens? Why Santa Claus? Why the presents? Why, 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 why? And uh, and I said, well, you know, there's there's an answer to that. <laughs> there always is, you know? Um, and and uh, so much of, of my career has been based on finding and telling the backstory of anything. I mean, what's a haunting? A haunting is a place with a reputation for having a ghost. And why does it have that? The the only way to answer is to go back and and backfill and say, well, let's look at what took place here and see who lived here, who died here, what events happened. And then from there, you can sort of figure out how we got to right now. And Christmas has its own story. Changes every year. It's being added to all the time. Um, And it's it's really a beautiful, incredible story when you include all of it, when you don't try to just you know, wash away the parts that make you uncomfortable. The whole picture is actually better because you realize that I'm putting that wreath up for a good reason. It's not, it's not just because it looks pretty. It's not just because my dad did it or my dad's dad did it. I'm doing it because our ancestors looked out on the winter landscape and saw that winter kills everything out there. It kills the flowers and the trees and the grass. And we said the ponds freeze and everything else, but it doesn't kill the evergreens. So there must be something inherently magical about them. They must be so powerful that they can stand up to winter. And so we take those branches and we, we put them over our doors and windows. We fasten them into, into wreaths. Uh, and we hope those prickly needles will keep the bad spirits outside and the good cheer inside. When you embrace that a little bit, whether metaphorical or literal, however you feel, it means something when you put the wreath up. I truly do want to keep the bad cheer out of my house uh, all year, but it le- especially around the holidays when it's a little bit stressful, relatives are coming, you know, we're spending a lot of money. I want, I want it to mean something. And now those traditions do mean something to me. They, they, I'm doing the same thing I did for years and years. I'm still putting up the tree and the mm-hmm. lights and the candles, but now I know why I'm doing it. And I'm connecting to thousands of years of history that included everyone my Jewish friends, my atheist friends, you know, my Christian friends, everybody. And, and now it, it feels, it feels more special to me now. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. And it just, because I took a journey through a a couple thousand years of history to learn how we got here. Well, that's one thing I love about the book. There's tons of inclusivity in the book. Uh, We're all in this together, whatever your faith belief system might be. And I too uh, would sit and outside with, uh, you know, numbing fingers and put things up and wondering why I did it. And isn't there an easier way to do things and why am I doing this and how much money, you know, and it's kind of, it's, you kind of get into that jaded mindset, but then even with stores, putting things up way too early, but now I kind of look at it a little bit differently and like how nice that you have the opportunity to go and kind of plan ahead and think ahead and decide what kind of decorations you want on your house. And if you want to buy them in November, that's fine. That's great. Sure. If you want to leave them up till February, go right ahead. You know. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I, right. Of course. Yeah. Right. Right. I love how 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 you're a great writer, and I love how you take those uh, all those kind of thoughts and feelings and and um, the, the um, mm, nostalgia of the holiday, but also infuse it with like uh, with with this history, and also just you know, it's just a lot of fun. It's a great book. I just really enjoyed reading Thank it. Thank you. And. Like I said before, how handsome of a packaging it is. Like my compliments to your design staff or whoever worked on putting yeah. this together. And kudos for putting a child getting beat by Krampus on the cover. I mean, what's more holiday? What's, what shows so, holiday spirit more than that? <laughs> I know you can see this because we're on Zoom. Your listeners can't. I got a right. six foot tall standee made of that that Krampus from the cover that I'm going to be bringing to my uh, my appearances so people can get pictures taken with Krampus. Um that's yeah, that was worth every penny, by the way. Um, I love so it. I love it. <laughs> uh, but but no, but, but I, I that I, I love the cover, too. And again, I had very little to do with it other than I, I told them I loved it once they showed it to me. Um, but if you look at I'm, I picture very actually, you could go out right now. All the holiday books are out at the big booksellers and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, I see like, you know, a very special Christmas, a warm and happy, lovey Christmas. And then there's going to be this screaming child being dragged by a monster 
And, and my people are going to look and go, that one. I want that one. <laughs> my, <laughs> right? my people, for sure. <laughs> Everyone else will be like, oh, God, no. And that's fine. That's It's not for everybody. That's that's all right. We all like different flavors of ice cream. It's all good. But uh, but I sort of feel like my people will be drawn to it. And and, and one of the things, too, the uh, the live show that I've been doing for years now and, mm-hmm. and doing it again this year, I discovered this very early on when we would make flyers and stuff for the program. I, I, at first I was like, you know what, we should probably put on here. Don't bring your young children. And, um, because like, I don't, you don't want to show up with your six year old and you don't, you don't want that. You don't want any part of that. Right. right. This, this isn't for young kids. And so what I didn't foresee was how many butts and seats that would help with. Right. So when you see, when you walk by a flyer that says Christmas program about the scary parts of Christmas, the the warning label got bigger and bigger on the flyers over the years. Do not bring your kids. <laughs> and suddenly people are like, Oh, Day oh now I'm listening. Like, yeah. Oh, now, now I want to know, right. I can't bring my kids. I will see you there. And, uh, and it was fun. And by the way, kids don't need this. Kids already have the magic. I hope, right. I hope they're, right. they're already full of all the Christmas spirit and magic. Adults need it. Adults need to be reminded of, uh, of why we do all this and that it is still worth doing. And, you know, I, like I said, it's literally a high that that I've chased year after year. Well, Jeff, personally, I just want to thank you for you know taking this time to talk to me about this great book. And I'm a big fan of yours. I listen to your podcast all the time, New England Legends. Uh, and also, I mentioned earlier that uh, I watched one of your um, live productions that you did with these fantastic storytellers. It's on YouTube. Um, yep. But if you look behind me, you'll see some posters of some uh, live events that my podcast has done featuring like John Tenney and Cindy Keza was just the last one. And what I tried to do is kind of take like the spirit of what you were doing, like taking great presenters and great stories and kind of putting them together on stage live. Cause I love that interaction with a live audience doing a podcast is super fun. And I love talking to guests, but I love like being in front of a crowd and, and introducing great speakers and kind of putting together like a festive fun atmosphere. And, and I just want to thank you for like taking the paranormal and letting us know it's okay to laugh and have fun. You can be, <laughs> you can be chilled to the bone, but also you can, it, it can also warm your heart. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's the paranormal is I, I'm, I love it. I mean, it's my whole life. Right. But, but I, I truly love it because it allows us to explore some deep seated stuff that's within all of us. It's like I said, in our DNA. And th- in this case, we're talking about monsters of the holiday season, but whether it's ghosts or aliens or Bigfoot or, or any or cryptids or any other thing that's out there, it allows us to ask the really big questions and understand that we don't have all the answers and, and some people get really upset by that, but I sort of take comfort in it. Like, mm-hmm. I don't want to live in a world where everything is defined and understood. And, and you know, uh, I think part of the mystery is, is part of the individual human experience is that you get to define your own human experience, what you want to believe and not believe. And, you know, we see that every day, but there's certain commonalities that we have. We're all going to die one day. Yeah. We're all, you know, uh, to quote Dickens once more, we are fellow travelers to the grave, right? Uh, not bound on different destinations or journeys. We are going in one direction. We're all going to get there at different times, but that's where we're going. And we might as well sort of look out for each other a little bit along the way if we can. Oh, so well put. Jeff, man, master storyteller, master author, just great guy, Jeff Belanger. Thanks so much for being on the program and my very best to you in this holiday season to you and your family. Thank you, Brian. You as well. Well, there we go, everybody. Episode 263, The Fright Before Christmas. With your friend and mine, the great Jeff Belanger. How exciting to have Jeff on the show again. I really respect the work that Jeff puts into his books, his live presentations, his his podcasts. You know, it'd be a bucket list item for me to work with Jeff. If you're listening, maybe you should come to Omaha someday. Next up on Necronomicast, episode 264, to close out the year, writer and director Adam Marcus. His newest creation, Secret Santa. You gotta see that. The most vulgar Christmas movie you've ever seen. But you might know him. And we're going to have a great conversation about Friday the 13th, Part 9. What you might know as Jason Goes to Hell. 
So Adam Mark is coming up to close out the year. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening to Necronomicast. Hope your holiday preparations are going well. But thanks for taking the time out to listen to this show. Have a great night and a great life. Now go get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs>